The plan for the French was to sneak up onto the fort. What happened was a very alert sentry on the walls of the fort heard strange noises out on the lake, on the ice. And he alerted the post. So the surprise element for the French was taken back. Historians think that the French were out there and with their tomahawks, with their tomahawks, they were testing the thickness of the ice. That's why they were chopping at the ice. Again, the British are up on the wall. There's some outside fort. This is a French probing force. They want to see where the strength or weakness of the fort is. Now, they're firing at powder muskets. And one of the problems with black powder is that when there's moisture in the air and dampness, sometimes the musket does not work. And the way it works is you put powder at the back of the barrel. There's a hole at the back of the barrel. And then there's a little plate or pan on the side of the back of the barrel. And when the flint, which is a hard stone, strikes the steel of the prism, it creates a spark, which sets off the cartridge. The spark sets off the powder that's in the little pan. The flame goes through the little hole in the back of the barrel, sets off the powder in the barrel, sets the projectile down. Now, again, moisture, rain, or even heavy humidity and dampness makes that turn into pudding instead of sparking and firing. So if we were out here and it was pouring rain, we couldn't have the bath. These ones were not off. But even on days like this, now you see the British coming out of the fort to repel these scouts. The British are sailing now. This is a force to go out and try to push those scouts back. They're starting to push back. Now, as I was saying, if moisture gets into those barrels or into the powder, it will not ignite. So even with a, a good day, a nice dry day, sometimes one out of ten muskets will not fire. So as you watch the reenactors today, you will see occasionally they fire. They're up on the walls and some outside fort. This is a French probing force. They want to see where the strength or weakness of the fort is. muskets and one of the problems with black powder is that when there's moisture in the air and dampness sometimes the musket does not work and the way it works is you put powder at the back of the barrel there's a hole at the back of the barrel and then there's a little plate or pan on the side of the back of the barrel and when the flint, which is a hard stone, strikes the steel of the prism, it creates a spark, which sets off the cartridge. The spark sets off the powder that's in the little pan. Wow. These weapons are 75 caliber and smooth bore. One of the reasons 18th century armies stand shoulder to shoulder together when they fight is to maximize that firepower with all that lead ball going down range.
Now, what they would use them for is a rallying point. So you could see your big battle flag up there. So if the battle gets people all over the place, the troops could rally to the flag. They can see that big battle flag there and they're all doing You notice the French troops are firing in line. This type of warfare in the 18th century was called linear warfare. And again, just imagine, this is a small group of reenactors, but imagine if we had a thousand men on line, shoulder to shoulder, and we fired all at once. We would have a lead wall coming toward the enemy. And again, they did this because the weapon misfired, so one out of ten might misfire on a good condition. That's a well-fired volley by those reenactors. If they're well trained and well drilled when they fire the muskets as a group like that, it should almost sound like one large musket going off. And they did a very good job firing there. And the troops on the wall, they're firing individually up there on the wall. Again, they're protected by that wall. Now, linear warfare, again, in mass, firing together. When they did that, they would fire three or four times in the battle. Then they would fix their bayonets. In the open fields, they would try to charge or drive their enemy off the battlefield. Now, they wouldn't have done this against the fort like this, but that's how most 18th century battles were fought. Sieging or digging trenches and moving forward is what they would have done to a big fort under normal conditions. But again, remember, we are portraying a raid. That's well You can hear that. It sounded like one musket going off. That's well You can hear that. It sounded like one musket going off. And again, they're close. Now imagine the smoke of the muskets going off, the smell of the gunpowder, the screams of the wounded. So to be a century soldier and live through a battle, it took a lot of courage to stand there. Uh, most of us, if somebody was shooting at us, we'd be running and hiding behind a tree somewhere. The Native Americans did that. But the the British and French soldiers did not. They were out in the open like this. Again, that linear warfare. Native Americans did not do that because they could not afford to lose that many men. So for most Native Americans, their tribe only had, let's say, 300 people, half of which were men. So you got 150 men. So if you went to a battle and you lost 10 men of your 150 male members of your tribe, that really put a dent in your protection of your village, your food gathering, your hunting. Just willy-nilly, they, they're precise, in units, under the command of their officers. So they're under control, oh, they're they well drilled troops. So you'll see the French starting to move forward, over near the water, you'll notice their scouts and coeur de bois, which are woods runners, people who have lived out with the natives, learned how to fight wilderness warfare, out in the tree lines out there, using trees, fences for cover. You'll see that closer to the water if you look out there. They have a separate style from the regular troops. The regular troops are near you with the big battle fight. The coeur de bois, the police, Native American, Amerindians, they're near the water in front of you now. You'll notice the tactics are different. So the ones near the water, we call that wilderness warfare. 
And that was in the wild. Particularly the British. The British did not do that very well. The French had a much better grip on it because they had come over and along the Mohawk Valley all the way out to Buffalo and keep them neutral. And for the most part, the Iroquois nation stayed neutral except for the Mohawk. And they kind of played sides. Um, toward the end of the war, even the French natives started to realize that both sides were playing them against each other. So the natives felt it didn't matter who they were, they were going to get the shit. in the siege or raid, oh, a lot of men going back up the Carillon on the next day, on the 23rd, was a bright sunny day, and the sun was bouncing off the snow and ice, and many of the French got snowboarded, and they had to comrades back up the Carillon. So many of them didn't suffer from the battle itself, but suffered from snow blindness and probably frostbite going back up the Carillon uh, on the 23rd. That ends the, the battle on the 23rd. The British, they hold the battle, but the French have damaged them greatly by burning down their sloops. Because what the British wanted was to have larger ships that they could sail up to the forge and could the water. And folks who certainly with many cannons on board can devastate the boats and canoes. So if you have something on the lake, you control the lake. So that's what it takes out of the picture for the summer of 1757. Of course, they were miserable because the French had burned down all their firewood, and now they had to... Now all the French regulars are coming out of the city today. They're going to drive the French regulars back. They're in the air, so these weapons will misfire. So what you're seeing, these misfires, that is exactly what would have happened in a true 18th century battle. That's why they stand side by side. Now the British are using what we call street fighting tactics, where they fire and the next group moves up and fires as they advance. But the British are having a lot of trouble with their weapons. The French are starting to pull back a little bit. Okay, I said one out of ten weapons would misfire. Let me change that to five out of five. Okay, we got one shot out of five. We're, we're there. And again, you notice how close they are to each other. This would have been the distance for a typical 18th century battle. About 75 to 50 yards away. Again, you would have seen enemy eyeball to eyeball. You would have seen the carnage, the blood, hear the noise, the screams again. The faint of heart did not fight in the 18th century. And then, in the first week of August of 1757, he's able to come down in his smaller whaleboats and with his whole army and lay siege to Fort William Henry. And after a of siege 
Rising in the summer, August of 1757, the British were forced to surrender Fort William City to the French. And most of you have seen or heard of the movie The Last of the Mohegans with Daniel Day-Lewis. That was the result of that siege and battle. And part of the reason that victory was possible was again, this raid eliminated the British fleet off Lake George, cleared the way for the French to have that victory in 1757. The British are having a hard day at the office. Gentlemen, to the front. Mark, to the back. Carries. You guys got to go behind us. Regulars, halt. Make ready! Freeze it! Fire! Better. Everybody fight. Again, the troops are under control of their officers. Notice they're not running all over the place. Now the troops in green that you just fired, those are New York provincial troops, again, provincials were people who lived in the